Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So please be seated. I was thinking about going on holiday. This summer we'll be going away. And to our great happiness, Hannah and Michael have said they'd like to join us. And they're, in their, they're grown ups now, so it's, it's a really lovely thing that they actually still want to be with us on holiday. Of course, when they're small, when Hannah was tiny, there was no question or negotiation. It's simply get in the car, we go. <laughs> but we weren't totally unsympathetic to the fact that they were children. We'd try and find somewhere that was actually pleasant. The idea of one of these packaged things with somewhere hot and sunny with everything laid on is quite appealing when you have small children because you don't have to think about anything then. We never actually went on one of them, but I could see the attraction. But as um, when they were small, we went to New Wine because we were concerned that our children were the only children we knew that that would belong to a family who were Christians. And we wanted them to meet other children from that background, so we used to go to New Wine. And for a few years, it was jolly good. And then along came Isaac, and he hated it. <laughs> he absolutely hated it. And, and then Sibia had to go on a French exchange, so we had to drive her all the way there to meet her family. So that year we kind of skipped New Wine and we went to France instead. And basically we haven't been back since. So now we go on a different kind of thing. And the children still join us, except for Isaac, who doesn't get any choice. But it's lovely that they actually want to. And that's the kind of, represents the kind of growing up of the family, that when the children are small, you just say, get in the car, we're going. And as they get older, it's, would you like to come? (laughs) And it kind of represents also a kind of attitude about their faith, in that when they're tiny, you make decisions for them. And I saw it it, uh, paraphrased once as, get in the car, we're going to heaven, which I thought was a great way of summing up our attitude to the kids. (laughs) But of course, as they get older, you have to negotiate. Would you like to come to heaven, children, or would you rather go the other place? And we're hoping that they'll continue to choose to go to heaven. Heaven being a kind of euphemism in a way, because when I say go to heaven, what I mean is, would you like to join us walking with God in the presence of the living God in this life? And would you like him to live with you hereafter as we re-establish the new heaven, the new earth, the new creation, and we inhabit it in the resurrected Christ, in our resurrected bodies? Going to heaven isn't about floating in clouds with harps and fluffy things. It's about living in our bodies in the presence of the living God. No longer separated, no longer, if you like, alienated, no longer at a distance, but wholly face to face. And that's, if you like, the promise laid out before us. And this um, this huge reading from Noah, (laughs) I apologize to the readers today, but that's just what the lectionary gave us, I'm afraid. And they wanted to obviously encompass the story of the flood from the beginning to the end, as far as it's sort of humanly possible in one go, one bite. The bit they left off at the very start, well, they left out two bits really, which it'd be quite good to mention. One is, it says, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So that was, if you like, the motivation for it that everyone was basically evil and the Lord was grieved that he had made us. But, it says, 
Noah was righteous and blameless in his generation. And he, if you like, stood out. That is not a common description in the Bible, in Scripture. In fact, I think Noah is the only one ever described as righteous and blameless precisely. So he's unique in Scripture in that respect. And it says, and he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found grace. And so notwithstanding his human weaknesses, he was considered righteous and blameless and found grace. And therefore, the Lord said to Noah, build an ark. And the outstanding thing is, he did it. <laughs> that really is the distinctive feature of Noah's life. He did it. This story, it's curious, it doesn't go into the inner life of him at all. It gives virtually no description of him whatsoever. And it's, what I find quite interesting about the story of Noah is that if you follow what you might call the cognate literature, there's all kinds of legends about the flood and about the, this character. There's a curious, actually, consistency to all of them. And all of them go back to a Sum Sumerian city called Shurup Shurupak. And so all the evidence would suggest that Noah was a Sumerian from Shurupak. Just out there. It doesn't actually say that in scripture, but it doesn't say he's not. And he can't be an Israelite because Israelites weren't invented then. But the whole story is about God destroying evil and renewing the face of the earth. In Psalm 104, it says, you breathe out your spirit, you breathe out, O God, the ruach, the breath of God, the spirit of God, and you renew the face of the earth. And the story of the flood is the story of God destroying evil, judging evil, and renewing the face of the earth, repopulating it, if you like. And so it's a sign of baptism. In other words, Noah was baptized in the flood the earth was baptised in the flood. And it's a sign of resurrection. The idea of Noah coming out of the earth is, is almost like him rising from the dead. And so when we baptise children or adults now, we're invoking, if you like, the sign of the flood, the destruction of evil and the resurrection of the dead and the renewal of life on earth when we, in, when we do that. And this, um, this story of the renewing of the face of the earth is really where it's going at, because at the end of it, he finishes with that covenant that never again will I destroy every living thing. If you like, God um, emphasizes his commitment to what he has made, that he will not simply obliterate it, that he is committed to upholding what he has made, that he is committed to restoring it and renewing it. And that story of the flood also has this idea of grace towards Noah and towards the people that listened, his family. There's a couple of other stories a bit like the flood in which God destroys evil and in which a handful of people actually listen. There's the story of um, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It says the outcry against them rose to heaven, so great was their wickedness. It describes them elsewhere in scripture as being arrogant and well-fed, among other things. And in that story, the nephew of Lot has been prayed for by Abraham. And the angels who have come to bring about the destruction of the city go to Lot's house and say to Lot, Lot, it's time to leave, boy. The city is about to be destroyed. Bring with you anyone that you care for, because if they don't come, they're going to die. And it's a kind of tragic story because Lot cannot persuade his family his sons-in-law laugh at him, thinking that he's joking. His neighbours ignore him. And in the end, only he, his wife, and his two daughters leave the city. And his wife turns back. So in the end, only three of them escape. And they, if you like, are the ones that listened. They're the ones that actually pay attention and to whom the grace has been shown, the grace for deliverance. And another story a bit like it is the one of Jericho in which the city of Jericho is somehow emblematic of the wickedness of Canaan. <clears throat> and one of the most egregious things the Canaanites did, which the Lord hated, was that they sacrificed their babies, their children. The Lord hates that, <laughs> above practically everything else. And it's the kind of final, final, if you like, the, the rhetoric of the Lord's utter disdain for the evil on the earth, that people end up sacrificing their children. And it's the thing which, if you like, somehow encapsulates the evil that people do. 
that when it comes to it, that some people are even willing to do that. And somehow that is the very epitome of evil in the Lord's sight. And so somehow Jericho is, is somehow the symbol of that destruction of that evil. And Rahab, you might remember, whose profession was that she was a, a lady of the night, you might say. She was a, a hospitable woman. She welcomed the spies in her hospitality, the spies from the Israelites, from Joshua. And she said to them, we know the city will be destroyed. We know that you've got it in for us. She said, will you look after me? And they said, yes, we will. You've looked after us, we'll look after you. And they said, anyone that you care for, if they stay in your house, will be safe. And so she paid attention. She said to her family, <laughs> if you want to be safe, come into my house. And they did. And they survived. And interestingly, Rahab laid aside her former profession. She respected an Israelite. And she had a grandson whose name was Boaz. And Boaz married a woman called Ruth, who is from Moab. And Boaz and Ruth had a grandson whose name was David. So David had a very distinctive lineage. David, of course, became the ancestor of Jesus. So Jesus has a very interesting family tree. And David, of course, was the writer of the psalm, which we just sang the paraphrase of, the 23rd psalm. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. How this kind of works with the idea of the good shepherd, I think, and with the idea of going on holiday, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd, the one who leads his sheep. The image he gives is that he leads his sheep. Shepherds in our country tend to round them up with dogs and kind of push them along. But if you watch a person with sheep in, the, in that area, in Greece or in Turkey or the Levant, they tend to walk in front of them, calling them, and their own sheep will follow them. And if you read the whole of the 10th chapter of John, you'll hear how Jesus separates out his sheep. He goes into the various folds in which sheep are kept, and he calls his sheep. His sheep hear his voice, and they follow him. And that's the distinctive thing about his sheep. They hear his voice, and so they follow him. And there it gets a little bit like Noah and Rahab and, um, and Lot, in that they're the ones that heard the voice, and they followed. They went out at the right time. So Jesus calls his sheep, and they follow him. But Jesus isn't just trying to, if you like, profiteer from them. He is the one who actually cares for his sheep and lays down his life for them. He says this four times in that short passage in John 10. He lays down his life for his sheep. And that is what sets him apart from the others. He really cares about his sheep, and he'll lay down his life for them. But he also has the ability, not just to lay it down, but to take it up again. An obvious reference to his crucifixion and resurrection. But also, I think, a reference to the very fact that he came to earth in the first place and then ascended to the Father's side. He did both those things for our sake. He became a human being, a man, in order that we would be like him and ascended to the Father's side as a man in order that a representative of us, his men and women, his people on earth, is in there in heaven. And so he lays his life down on the earth. He lays his life down in the grave. He rises again from the dead. He takes it up again. And not just that, he takes it up to heaven to stand at the Father's side, to intercede on our behalf. But this sheep, this shepherd, leads his sheep, it says, out to the pasture to take care of them. And this is where it's going a bit like holiday and a bit like Noah. He leads his sheep into the new creation. He calls his sheep, and if they follow him, he says he is the door for the sheep, the gate for the sheep. He leads us out through himself into a new world, into the new creation. As Noah and his family walked out from the ark on that day, he invites us to walk out with him in the new heaven and the new earth at the end of all things. And that's if we hear his voice. 
He's not going to force anyone. He's not going to put levers on people. He's not going to coerce them or manipulate them. He's simply going to invite them. He's going to call us by our names. And if we'll listen and go after him, he'll lead us. And as the psalmist says, even though we go through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For we have a guide and a companion who will lead us faithfully all the way to the very end. And it's no accident that the psalmist says he will lead us, he puts us now in the green pastures by the still waters, he restores our soul now in the present. If you go to the Judean hills, there's barren wasteland up on the hilltops there. I once went up um, to En Gedi, the spring of the kid. And if you go up from the Dead Sea, you go up through this valley in the gully where the river sort of comes down and it's quite green in, in places. But if you get to the very top, the, the top of the plateau there is really barren and rocky and dusty and dry. And I was trying to find um, uh, the, the ibex up there, trying to take photos of them. And I was chasing all over the hillside trying to get them and usually get the tail <laughs> as they disappear into the distance. <laughs> so all hot and sweaty. I knew the others were all going to sit around the pool of En Gedi itself. There's this beautiful pool there, surrounded by trees and shade, and the water sort of wells out from the rock. It's absolutely lovely. And compared to the barren, dusty, rocky hillside, it's just paradise. Anyway, all hot and sweaty and frustrated, I got back there, flopped down, and said, oh, gosh, that was a boy, everyone kind of thing. And they went, shh. And there on the other side of the, the pool, they're all coming down to drink. <laughs> So I've been chasing them all over the place. And if I just sat there and waited, they'd have just walked in front of me, <laughs> one after the other. And by then, of course, I'd run out of film, so I couldn't take any pictures. So there we go, never mind. So much for my photography and wildlife. But it's a lovely experience to just sit there by the pool of En Gedi and see the, the ibex coming down to drink. You see the little kids coming down and kneeling down and the great big males with their huge horns and their, the, <coughs> the females, I can't remember what, would they be bucks and does? They'd be... Um, Danny's and his rams and ewes, I'm not quite sure. But that's what I think of when I, remit, when I read the psalm. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This shepherd will lead us in the path through life, the path that's worth going on. Through life, there are lots and lots of turnings we can take, and most of them go nowhere. <laughs> but if we follow this shepherd, we'll follow the path that goes somewhere, somewhere that's worth going. We'll end up where we'd like to be. <coughs> and we will fear no evil, for he is with us. His rod and his staff will comfort us. And at the end of the psalm, we get this lovely image. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The eternal promise. The eternal home. The eternal commitment of the Lord to us, his grace and his loving kindness. And Peter knows this, and he emphasises this. It's a great irony that the name Annas in the high priest is derived from the Hebrew name Hananiah, which means the Lord is gracious, <laughs> which is very true. The Lord is indeed <laughs> gracious. But Annas is not being particularly gracious here and not particularly cognizant of the Lord's grace either. He seems quite blind to it, in fact. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says, This man that you did to death, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus, the stone <coughs> rejected to you, the builders, has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. And there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So Jesus is, if you like, shown to us as being something like a new Noah. The one, the good shepherd, who will lead his sheep, calling them by name, through the paths of life, through the barren uplands, through the dry places, that he is the one who will give us the living water to drink, the heavenly manna to eat, the green pastures to lie down in on our journey through life, on our travail. He is the one that gives rest to our souls. And he is the one who will finally lead us home, 
and though that path will one day go through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for we know that he is with us. This is his covenant to us, his promise to us. This is his loving kindness, his grace, his mercy, his compassion to us. And this is his offering to us, if we will just hear his voice. Amen.